the education of the child. So, Robert. Okay, thank you. When I started this, uh, or did the proposal for this lecture, I was going to talk about the curriculum, but there are two, two aspects to the education of the child. There's the teacher and there is the curriculum. Fortunately, there is a um, Gebserian curriculum, which has been active for about 20 years now. It was designed by eminent uh, cultural historian William Merwin Thompson, uh, who was the uh, founding director of the Lindisfarne Association, and uh, it's being practiced at the Ross School on, in, uh, in New Haven, Long Island. Not New Haven, Long Island. Uh, in Long Island. Uh, yeah, in Long Island. Uh, I also wrote a cultural education curriculum in my book. I wrote the curriculum in 1984. And I spent 20 years trying to figure out how to justify it. So my approach is a bit different than uh, that of uh, William Erwin Thompson. But I decided in this talk that I'm, that I'm going to, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the curriculum toward the end. But the main subject that I wanted to get involved with was the concept of child development. And this is the part that, that is most interesting to the teacher, because the teacher uh, has to make that, that connection with the child and understand child development. And union psychology does not give us a very good image of child development. So why talk about this? Why talk about it in terms of Gebser and Jung? And why do we need to educate the child? <coughs> Gebser says, the new spiritual reality is without question the only security. Its realization alone seems able to guarantee man's continued existence in the face of the powers of technology, rationality, and chaotic emotion. If our consciousness cannot master the new reality and make possible its realization, then the prophets of doom will have been correct. We've been hearing about the prophets of doom and, and all of the things that have been going on all morning long. Other alternatives are an illusion. Consequently, great demands are placed on each of us, and each one of us have been given the grave responsibility not merely to survey, but to actually traverse the path opening before us. And what I have concluded out of that is that the responsibility of our generation is to educate our children to this new consciousness, to show them the way, to show them how they can get there. Jung, of course, we can start where, with what we know, and that is that Carl Jung was not at all interested in the development of the child. He did say that the, uh, the ego develops out of the self, and here I'm showing the self <coughs> with a capital S as the Godhead. On the left I put God, on the right I put the world. And that's where we all exist, between, between the transcendent spirituality of the cosmos and the world. But that development uh, was not something that Jung interested himself in. This I've shown the collective unconscious on this side of the cultural superego, which is the barrier I place between the collective unconscious and the collective consciousness. The ego develops into collective consciousness, and at some point in midlife, it will turn itself around and seek uh, to reconnect with this self, capital S, with, which is a transcendent self. The process leads the ego on an inward journey toward the inaccessible self, the Godhead. And Jung says, it is completely outside the realm of the personal sphere. It appears only in terms of a religious, religious mythologium, visible only in symbolic form. So uh, Jung left the development of the child to others. Along came Eric Neumann in 1934, met Jung, went through the process of becoming a Jungian analyst, had worked on the concept of the child's development. In The Origin and History of Consciousness, Neumann really takes a phylogenetic perspective, the same as Gebser, which um, 
implies recapitulation theory. The idea that the development, the ontological development of the child recapitulates the phylogenetic development of humanity. And very simplistically, the ego separates itself from the archetypal, from the, from the Godhead self, the transcendent self, goes into an Ouroboric stage, then into a mother stage, and then finds itself confined in the collective consciousness of the father before it finally turns back inward in the individuation process. But Neumann, somewhere along the line, developed a concept that he called central version. And his central version, there's a, a, a paradox in this because central version relies on the connection between the ego and the self or containing an ego self axis. And if the self is conceived only as being a transcendent Godhead, then that's not possible because the transcendent Godhead is, uh, is not at all personal. So in the late 1950s, well, <laughs> first of all, I was a developmental individuation is a term that I've coined that retains the link between the archetypal self and the developing ego through the process of development, throughout the process of development. And that link is essential to personality. Jung talks about personality as being the relationship between the developing ego and the archetypal self, which is different from the transcendent self. And I'll get to that in a minute. And that's what connects Neumann's central version or concept of central version to Gebser's integrality. In Neumann's new concept, uh, which he wrote about in The Child, which he started in 1957, but unfortunately never finished the manuscript because he died at the age of 54 in 1960. He, uh, I don't know that he took this idea from Fordham or not, which I misspelled, haven't I? Uh, but Fordham, um, Michael Fordham, which some of you may know, <clears throat> really uh, got into conflict with Neumann about the development of the individual. He said, no, there's a primary self. And the primary self contains the archetypal self, which is the self with a small s, and the ego. So Neumann took that concept. I don't know if he took it directly from Fordham or he developed it in parallel. But, but his idea was that there, his new idea in the development of the personality, because the, 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 the the new book that he wrote, the first book that he wrote is The Origin and History of Consciousness. But The Child, the subtitle of The Child, is Structure and Dynamics of the Nascent Personality. So we're talking about the difference between development of consciousness and development of personality. <coughs> so what he sees is this primary self, that, that archetypal self in the individual, is evoked or stimulated by what he calls the two-footedness of the archetype. And the two-footedness of the archetype, he says, an archetype cannot be evoked by any spontaneous process within the psyche. However, Neumann goes on to say, when two human beings are united by a powerful bond, their mutual appetency forms a bilateral connection between them, releasing the corresponding archetypes in the psyches of each other. And once the archetype has been evoked successfully, it can become autonomous and function like an independent organ. So now we have a situation in which the archetypal self, or we could call it the soul if you like, the archetypal self and the ego retain this connection throughout development. The self, the archetypal self, is connected to the transcendent self while the ego is directed toward moving toward the world. And so you have this situation that once the ego crosses the barrier of the cultural superego and, 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 and becomes connected with the world through collective consciousness, hopefully that ego self axis is retained. As such, you have this concept of central version. <coughs> 
when the ego does turn inward, it turns inward not toward the transcendent self, as Jung had originally concluded, but toward the archetypal self, which retains that, that dynamic interaction between the two. The self, the, the transcendental self, uh, are, the archetypal self is connected to the transcendent self, which is introversion, while the ego is connected to the world. So this is what, what gives uh, Neumann's concept of the development of consciousness a similarity to what Gebser can be implied to imagine from the ever-present origin, because his focus also was phylogenetic. But there are lots of, of ontological implications. So in Gebser, if we, take, if we give Gebser a union uh, formation, we can see that this archaic consciousness is really the same as, uh, as Neumann's concept of the self and the ego contained within a primary self-image. Now Gebser says and that, that self is, uh, is uh, evoked or activated by the relationship between the transcendental self and the child and the transcendental self and the mother. This, uh, this uh, two-footedness of the archetype. But the objective of archaic okay consciousness is not consciousness in the same sense that we recognize as, as, as mental consciousness. He calls it a wakeful, uh, Gebser calls it a wakeful presence. And that wakeful presence is the stimulation of activation of the archetypal self as a guide, as an inner guide to the personality. The ego is going to be also guided by the world, by the collective, by the collective culture. Magical consciousness, the ego and the self have, the ego has differentiated, but still attached to the self. And the self has to be nurtured in order for that to have an effect on ego conscious development. So a wakeful presence at the level of magical consciousness is what we call the participation mystique, or we can call it trans-individual relationships, that magical relationship between people, between individuals. At the mythical consciousness level, the self and the ego are separated, but still connected by an axis. Whereas the magical and archaic consciousness have both been subsumed into an unconscious space. The wakeful presence here is the awareness of the Imago Dei, what Jung called the Imago Dei, awareness of the uh, image of God within. Gebser says the mythical structure has an imaginary consciousness reflected in the imagistic nature of myth and responsive to the soul. The essential characteristic of the mythical structure is the emergent awareness of soul. Now each of these structures, you see, each of these structures um, has, a, is an aware, has a, a characteristic of personality which is um, evident. It's evident to the parent, but it's probably more evident to the teacher because you see this in the classroom all the time. For example, if the, uh, in archaic consciousness, if the self is not activated, then you end up with what you call, what's called the wounded child, on the wounded child syndrome. And that wounded child syndrome uh, has particular characteristics which evolve in, in, in the magical consciousness realm and in the mythical consciousness realm. For example, in the mythical consciousness realm, the child is projecting onto others. It will project that heroic, if it understands or, or is aware of that heroic image within, that, that, that Imago Dei will project it onto another, a parent, uh, an older sibling, a relative. And if it is not aware of that, or doesn't have that, that external projection, what we're seeing now is that it's projecting this archetypal self, this, this heroic self onto uh, avatars in virtual reality. This is happening a lot among young people. So in efficient, the efficient mode of mental consciousness, you see there's a connection between 
all of these structures of consciousness. There's a wakeful presence is retained by this connectedness to earlier structures of consciousness. And uh, Jung refers to that as well by saying that the ancient Greeks, which are, are, are probably one of the best examples of the efficient mode of consciousness, of mental consciousness, says that the weird and wonderful nature of the gods was a self-evident fact in a hundred living myths and assumed a special significance in the no less credible philosophical refinement of those myths. The deficient mode of mental consciousness, the cultural superego has become a solid barrier which affects mental consciousness which is directed toward the world but all of these other modes of consciousness are the structures of consciousness. The archaic, magical, and mythical structures of consciousness have been subsumed into the unconscious. And I would hypothesize that, that they break apart into various archetypal complexes. So here we have uh, Gebser's concept of integral consciousness. On integrality, Gebser says, in every instance, we are necessarily dealing with the ability of our faculty of consciousness to adapt itself to the different degrees of consciousness of the various structures. And only when they are integrated via concretion can they become transparent in their entirety and present. And they are not, of course, merely illuminated by the mind. So that is, uh, that is really the major difference. <coughs> Excuse me. In Neumann's uh, The Child, we also come to that same basic concept. The integration process, the personality goes back along the path it took during the phase of differentiation. And it is now a question of reaching a synthesis between the conscious mind and the psyche as a whole. This is an integration in which the expansion and development of consciousness are simply continued in a new direction, inward. And here I've I've indicated these unspecified earlier evolutionary stages of consciousness. Jung says in uh, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections that if the unconscious is anything at all, it must consist of earlier stages of consciousness. So I've left them here as undifferentiated. So that brings us to the two things that are required to change the educational system. And uh, we are at a point where, as has been discussed by Jeffrey earlier and by Sean, it, it, it really is time here and now to make this kind of change. And there's a great resistance to making this change in the educational system. But we need to change the teacher and we need to change the curriculum. And you change the teacher by empowering the teaching cadre. And, um, William Irwin Thompson and Ralph Abraham's uh, book, Transforming History, they don't talk about the teacher at all. Uh, in my book, I have a whole section which, which I call uh, Seeking the Archetype of the Teacher, which is about the teacher transforming him or herself, but in relation to the students in the class via this concept of the two-footedness of the archetype. If the teacher and the student in the class evoke the archetypes in each other, the archetype that is evoked in the teacher is the teacher archetype. And the archetype that is evoked in the child is the child archetype, or in the adolescent is going to be the heroic archetype. But that's, that's, that's the empowerment of the teaching cadre. The second thing you have to do is you have to educate the public as to why the cultural education curriculum is required. And that's a track that I took. Um, when I started doing this work, the, the uh, cultural education curriculum came to me in 1984. And in the early 90s, when I was living in Santa Cruz, I began studying the uh, uh, history of consciousness. And I was trying at that time to formulate my own cultural education curriculum, but I found that, first of all, I didn't know as much as William Irvin Thompson about cultural education, about the cultural education, uh, cultural history of the world. But I did determine that what we had to teach was the cultural continuum of humanity and not a cultural education, as, as Jeff said, about, called a cultural complex, the American cultural complex.
That's not relevant anymore. What's relevant to all of us is the cultural continuum of humanity. And then you have to formulate and design the curriculum, which uh, the model that was developed by Thompson and Abraham follows this Gebserian quote. By returning to the very source of human development as we observe the structures of consciousness unfold, we can not only discover the past, but also gain a view into the future, which reveals the traits of a new reality and it's the decline of our age. And so, Ralph Abraham and William Irwin Thompson developed a curriculum which is divided basically into the K through two, early childhood education, three through five, which is an intermediate level of education, and then six through 11 in this case, which is the, the uh, secondary level of education, and then uh, the grade 12 in which they bring it all together in a spiral. So uh, in a lot of ways, my basic model is similar to the one that uh, of the elementary level, the way the way the one that that uh, Thompson Abraham developed. <laughs> what happens in the Thompson Abraham model is that in the second grade, he develops certain themes, of which uh, the themes for the first and second grade are patterns and structures, for example. In my K through 12, I want to emphasize artistic expression and the interactive relationship with others, but basically the interactive relationship between the teacher and the student. So uh, what I, what I uh, have advocated is what's called the looping system, where the same teacher stays with the same group of students for a period of time. In the three through five, where you're talking basically about, or, or you're, you're emphasizing the magical and mythical structures of consciousness in my curriculum, I, I think it's important to emphasize two things. One is called cultural literacy, which was developed in 1987 in a book by uh, Edie Hirsch that some of you may have heard of, but cultural literacy on a world cultural basis, a global cultural basis, not not based on a particular cultural complex like the complex of the United States. And the other aspect is to emphasize in all of the cultures that are being studied two basic things, the difference between the spiritual and the profane, the sacred and the profane in all of those cultures. Um, in the Abraham Thompson model, the sixth through the eleventh grades really kind of focus on the mental structure of consciousness, and it brings in all different kinds of, of uh, uh, he does a, a, a very nice cultural history curriculum. He goes through the whole cultural history starting uh, with tribal cultures and ending with modern society. My uh, sixth grade curriculum, for example, he, he does a spiral approach in the, in the 12th grade. He says the spiral approach will integrate all of those structures of consciousness and give the student a, a concept of this whole integral idea. My spiral approach is in the sixth grade. It says, well, you know, you have to help the student anticipate where they're going to go. And so in the sixth grade, we look at the local community, the local area, and the study from the prehistoric era through the tribal cultures that inhabited that area, a, a, a very nice uh, piece that some of you read that was written by John about the, uh, the history of this area and of California. That's the same concept of my spiral approach to the sixth grade. You study all of, all of that uh, history, cultural history of this particular area, what cultures inhabited this area, wherever you are. And then in the seventh through twelfth grade is where I concentrate on the cultural curriculum of uh, the cultural continuum of humanity and the different structures of consciousness. And then in the eleventh and twelfth grade, my commitment is to a vocation. I want the student then to begin to think about what their calling is, what their uh, um, 
objective is in bringing about this new consciousness. So that's, that's stimulating their vocation, their vocational ideas. So again, the teacher, coming back to the teacher, in the Abraham Thompson model, there's little information about the teacher. He does say in the kindergarten, the beginning of the soul, the, be the beginning, the being and the soul of the parent of the teacher is more important than educational philosophy, which I agree with. And in my model, it's about seeking the archetype of the teacher through this concept of the two-footedness of the archetype. If you're evoking the archetype in the student, then the student is evoking the archetype of the teacher in you. So I think that's about all we have time for right now. Is that right? You had me five minutes left. Well, okay, I'll leave that open to questions then. classroom teacher for 20 years at the high school level, also dipping down sometimes and doing work at lower grade levels. I'm also grateful that my firstborn son is a middle school teacher in the uh, Seattle public school system. He teaches uh, U.S. history and world history to middle school children. Yeah. They're almost all immigrants in South Seattle. Uh, my daughter-in-law teaches third grade Cesar Chavez School here in Salinas. Uh, all her students are brown. And uh, to visit a classroom, I just to put our whole conference in that context for any of you who may also be class, have been classroom teachers or close to classroom teachers. Take everything in our conference. Visit a third grade classroom if you can. Visit a middle school classroom if you can. Because the children are there. You get emotional like I do. I, 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 I do that too. I, I, yeah. I do want to say that, that the STEM curriculum that's so dominant in the United States right now is a total disaster. They, uh, they, have, aban they have totally abandoned the cultural education curriculum or, or an idea of a cultural education curriculum. Jung said about that, that the purely utilitarian education uh, ha, uh, leaves you nothing to guard against uh, the, uh, the irrational and the counterfeit. And right now we have a counterfeit government and an irrational way of looking at the world. Thank right. You. I, well, uh, they added, they made it steam now, right, to give the appearance it, it, yeah, give but, the appearance, exactly. Um, might be a silly question. Why do you think this has not been adopted? <sighs> yeah. I think that part of it is the democratic idea that, that it's the economy, stupid, which is not. I wrote an article for the New York Times uh, this last spring which I title, it's not the economy, stupid, it's the culture. And I think that Donald Trump has, um, has, uh, has brought that to the, to the foreground. Now, what's happening in that sense is that Donald Trump Jr. gave a speech in El Paso, Texas last fe uh, February, which has been labeled the loser teacher speech. And that type of speech by a political leader, what that does is it inspires or instigates these young adolescents to go into their schools and to harass classroom teachers that they don't like or classroom concepts that they don't like. I read an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago about the school in Illinois where the uh, student organization for uh, the integration or, or intercommunication between the the LGBT and straight community was taking place, and a bunch of Catholic uh, uh, fundamentalists went in there 
uh, couples, girls and boys, holding hands and shouting at them that, that everything they were talking about was wrong and that they had to do. Well, this is part of the kind of disruption that takes place because Donald Trump Jr. makes a speech that says it's okay to do that. Well, so, you know, I can just say, never mind in, in sort of childhood education. Uh, I was just at a Jungian conference in Vienna and at a subcommittee meeting, we talked about the difficulties of training today because mm -hmm. the students are coming in with an attitude of entitlement mm -hmm. that is just o over the top. Um, recently, a candidate at the Institute, New, New York Institute took an exam and there was a typo in the, uh, the time that the exam was supposed to start. Normally the exam starts at 9 a.m., but there was a typo that said 8 a.m. And we said, what should we do? And the president of the institute said, we'd better make it 8 a.m. because this is a very litigious student. Wow. <laughs> so I I'm just adding to, you know, riffing off of what you said about Trump Jr. Um, it seems to be, you know, this whole attitude of entitlement by students and no accountability for, in themselves for where they're at in their process. Um, I guess it's not just in the younger, with the younger ones, but thanks. Yeah, well that's, that's why I think the empowerment of the teacher is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Because really? teachers, the teachers are getting stepped on by the administration and by the students and by the parents. Yeah. I just wanted some quick clarification about one of the quotes from Gebser. Okay. Talks about the integration or diaphanity between the stages of psychic development. It was on a previous slide. Uh, and uh, he says that's it's achieved through concretion. And I'm wondering if you can explain that or. The what? That, that the integration. Let's see if we can find the quote first. Yeah, it's, it's not verbatim at all. Succinctly, what did Gebser mean by concretion? Yeah. Oh, by concretion. That's a good question, and it, it's... Uh, he talks more about it in the sense that you can't really understand these other... other um, structures of consciousness simply, you can't simply illuminate them with mental consciousness. You have to go into them and to, I would say that the concretion comes from feeling, intuition, and instinct. And you have to relate to it more that way. Um, I give you some examples about how that, that exists in the child. Walt Whitman wrote it, here's, here's an interesting one. <clears throat> In terms of magical consciousness, Walt Whitman wrote a poem called um, uh, There Was a Child Went Forth, and everything he looked upon, he became, and that became part of him for a day or for a year or for many cycles of years. And that is the concept of magical consciousness, participation, mystique, and mystical and mythic, uh, magical consciousness coming together in the child. So if you can realize that again as an adult, which obviously Whitman did, because he understood that, that's concretion. That's coming to that concrete understanding of that particular level of magical consciousness. Coming to a concretion of mythical consciousness is going through what I call the individuation initiation Phase. I think somebody was talking, you were talking about initiation, weren't you? In which uh, you actually come face to face with your own archetypal guiding spirit. That's what the, the archaic tribal consciousness, tribal peoples will call. Well, the American Indians, for example, the American Indian vision quest is coming to know your own um, tutelary spirit, is what Eliade called it whether it's an animal archetype or, or a human form or whatever. So coming to that knowledge, 
as mental knowledge. Because when you're going through the phases of development, this phase of development, the Imago Dei is there. It's guiding the ego. But you're not consciously aware of it from the standpoint of mental consciousness. So concretion is going back and becoming aware of it from the point of mental consciousness, but seeing it as its own entity. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think that we're just not, as far as our collective development, we're just not at that middle age yet before we can kind of revisit our archetypal self? Or is it just a matter of time? This is, a, this is a, a very much a Jungian concept that you have to reach middle life before you can do that. I don't think that's necessary anymore. I think that a really good, here's a very good example that somebody brought up earlier of a, a young person who is very much aware of, uh, of her imago Dei, her archetypal spirit, and that's Greta Thunberg. I mean, she, this, uh, the, 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 the imago Dei in the, in the adolescent is always the, is always the hero, the heroic image. Unfortunately, modern psychology has made a, a, a huge mistake, in my opinion, in equating the heroic aspect of the psyche with the ego. Because the heroic aspect of the psyche is archetypal. And it's this archetypal self. This is, this is the heroic aspect. Being aware of it, being uh, wakefully present of it, that, that, that would be the concept of the, of, the, of the heroic aspect of the personality influencing the ego, but it's not the same. The ego is not the heroic aspect of the psyche. Thank you for a very interesting um, presentation. Um, just a, a brief comment and a, and a question. Um, I'm a trained Waldorf teacher. And I know that. Uh, yes, we Thank spoke you. yesterday. Um, and I see a lot of parallels, actually, um, which just points to the archetypal structure of these things, which the teacher, which uh, thinkers such as Steiner or Gebser or William Irwin Thompson or, you know, will echo in their various ways, for instance, uh, the whole uh, progression of the Waldorf curriculum is based on uh, willing, feeling, and thinking. Mm -hmm. the, the young child in pre-K, it's all willing and imitation. Um, <clears throat> the elementary grade school years, the emphasis is on reverence and awe and relationship to the teacher and the feeling life. And it's only when you get to um, high school that the mental consciousness structure in the independent thinking is emphasized. It's obviously there all along. They're all there all along, but it's, a, it's in terms of the emphasis of sequence. And that, um, I mean, Steiner talks in terms of willing, feeling, and thinking, but that's also magical, mythical, mental. Exactly. You know, so it's, it, it's there. Um, so that's the comment. The question, uh, and yeah, uh, uh, um, Waldorf education, too, is uh, confronting some degree of existential challenge because of the uh, how um, dissonant it is with social values and yeah. financial basis and teacher training and uh, all this stuff it's it's a crisis everywhere you know even Waldorf is the largest alternative uh, education in, in the world and it's uh, threatened really from from the uh, um, but my question is just a little bit of um, can you give us a, a flavor of your experience with using, um, I, you've taught this in um, curriculum at the Ross School, I, I understand, or? I didn't teach at the Ross okay. School, no. So do you have anything to share about the, 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 the fruits of this method from your contact with teachers at the school or whatever, just how it's worked out in real life? What, the Ross School? Or wherever this, these kind of models have been applied, Ross School, wherever you have knowledge about that, if you well, I, I, yeah, I speak a lot of it from my own experience in this part of the book when I talk about uh, seeking the archetype of the teacher. Mm 
seeking the archetype of the teacher in this, in this book is not an academic pursuit, it's a memoir of what happened while I was teaching. And actually when I was teaching in Santa Cruz in, uh, in the early 19, in the mid 1980s, um, uh, I was able to evoke those kinds of archetypal relationships with my students, which I discuss in this book. Um, Alan Bloom called it seeking uh, uh, the, the art of teaching, the way that Alan Bloom put it in his uh, classical book, The Closing of the American Mind, 1987. So these books came out, and these books came out in the late, there was a lot of work in the late 80s and early 90s about transforming education. And so much of that stuff has gotten buried. So much of it has gotten buried because of this emphasis purely on the utilitarian and economic aspects of education. And as a result, you know, the, the young people today, um, I was talking with somebody about geography the other day, they know nothing about geography, for example. They know nothing about culture. They're not learning anything about cultural, cultural studies or cultural identity or any of that. I, I think that one of the major aspects of education is what I call cultural identity formation. And in the United States, the traditional cultural identity formation was uh, the fundamental mandate of American education. But as Glenn said the other day, you know, that was based purely on the Eurocentric white, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant model of what the American identity was all about. So that's all in transition. And it's not only in transition in the United States, it's in transition in, the, in, in all of Europe where, where, where they're having this, this problem with immigration, you know, and integrating these, these culture, cultural immig immigrants, integrating that into a, a cultural identity that is more inclusive. So I'm going to break character for a minute and be the ray of sunshine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are two things that, if you're not aware of, I, I'd like to make you aware of and ask a question. Um, the first is, are you familiar with Bernie Neville? Bernie Neville is a Gapesarian in Australia who uh, actually was the keynote speaker at our conference in Hofstra. Who, I was there. So I know Bernie. Yeah. Right. So he has done a lot of work with education and bringing Gapeser into education. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who's interested in this, um, there's a third source out there that I, I call your attention to. His book is called Educating Psyche. Yes. Um, second is, as the parent of school-age children, um, I'd like to say that my children have been very, very fortunate because they've been in international baccalaureate programs, mm. which do have that global cultural education. The IB was designed by uh, diplomats so that their children could get a consistent education as they moved around the world. Mm -hmm. And it includes things that most American schools don't have. My, both of my children have foreign language every grade, every week, in certain grades, every day. Mm -hmm. Um, they have art and they have music and, you know, and so they've been very lucky. My, my 10th grader is in Chinese 4. So, um, so it's, it's pretty remarkable. The challenge, though, with creating this, I think, is, you know, I've been a professor for 25 years and the statistics about who goes into education are pretty depressing the lowest SAT scores across campuses, public, private, are always in the School of Education. The worst students become teachers, which isn't to say that teachers are, are dumb, but that this is a problem that we have across this country, is how do we attract talented people to become teachers. Because, you know, I, I think about my IT friends in here, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out a lot of the time. So, how do we create teaching methods that attract the best people, best suited to teach them? That's my question. 
Are you familiar with Clifford Mays? Clifford Mays was at um, NYU. I, I, I've kind of lost touch with Clifford. But uh, his book came out the same time that I self-published this one. And there are a lot of parallel examples in there. Now, he's a teacher of education. And I just wrote a chapter for a book that's going to be published by Alexandra Fadik. I don't know if some of you know, will know her, Jeff knows her. Um, in which I, I talk about a lot of these concepts about child. In fact, it's called uh, Developmental Individuations, and it is the title of the chapter. But you're right about the, the crisis. The, the crisis in education is worldwide. There are, um, you, how do you recruit teachers? And, and my answer to that is empowerment. If you, if you begin to empower the teacher and help the teacher to realize that this link between developmental individuation through the, 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 the two-footedness of the archetype stimulates that, that archetype of the teacher. That is the fulfillment. That is a fulfillment. There are a lot of teachers who go, and I talk about it in, my, in this book, that teachers go into, into the business for various reasons. Some of them go in just because it's the, the first step on the ladder toward moving up toward administration or going into college level education. But being a teacher of children in the K through 12 system is a fulfillment in itself. And if it's not a fulfillment in itself, then you can't recruit people and you can't retain people. It has to be a fulfillment in itself. That's why I talk about it in terms of seeking the archetype of the teacher. Do you ever actually get there? Well, no one ever manifests totally the archetypal aspect of the personality, but you do sense it in, your, in yourself, in that relationship with others. The archetype comes out. And so you're always in the process of seeking that when you're in the classroom. And I've known many good teachers. So it's not a matter of, of intelligence. It's not even a matter of pay. Although pay helps. It would help in recruiting. But if you can, if you can convince people or help people to understand that, that there is this, this self-fulfillment aspect to being a teacher, then that's going to help in the recruitment. But we've destroyed all of that. The, the, the current system destroyed all of that. And they don't want to listen to anything productive. Yes. Okay. Who has the mic? Oh, <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I was going to ask if you had heard of this. this. is a new book that just came out called Education in a Time Between Worlds, Essays on the Future of Schools, Technology, and Society. He's no, I don't know thinker. that book. Who wrote it? Who's uh, the Zach editor? Stein or Zachary Stein. He's a little bit more involved in the integral theory world. Um, but I've been listening to a few of his podcast conversations, and I bring it up because um, it seems that, number one, the question of how do we get these ideas promulgated in society, um, you were talking about myths and stories, but the other aspect of that is education, because I think those are very integral to each other. The teaching of the stories of the new generation, the showing them life ways, et cetera. Um, so this is a question and also a context that many of us are coming from. Either we want to be teachers or educators, or we have been, or we're going to be. Um, I've just been talking about becoming a professor myself um, in the coming years. So. Um, I guess it's more of a comment, though, on the sort of metasystemic issues, thinking of uh, Sean's image of all of the different um, <laughs> things that are fa uh, falling apart and breaking yeah, down in society. Yeah. Well, education and the supporting of the teacher um, can't be extracted from this sort of larger systemic um, dying, really, of, of the way in which we've been doing things. So, um, so there's that, there's that, which is a little depressing. But then the other opportunity here I'm seeing, and that I'm involved in too on my end, is this idea of online education. Uh, people are really hungry for alternative models. Um, it's, it's amazing how many people will sit down and listen to a three hour podcast with brilliant people um, or host online courses. So there's a lot of interesting experimentation right now as these older structures and models are no longer interesting or compelling, but are also failing us. So um, this is more of just a commentary on sort of our meta 
situation right now and how mm -hmm. education is in this sort of Cambrian explosion of alternatives. At the same time, everything is falling apart. And uh, anyway, just very, uh, very much appreciated your presentation and your work. So Thank you. I, I, I think that, that, that uh, this whole thing about online education is very valuable for adults. But the ch children, children have to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with an adult. This is another one of my, one of my problems with, the, with the, the Abraham Thompson model is that in the second grade, he, his curriculum is becoming so rigorous already that he's saying that you have to divide it into separate subjects taught by separate teachers and then he, rest, he, he justifies that by saying, well, it's a great idea if students have uh, contact with all these different adults. But my point is that if one teacher stays with a group of five to seven year olds for three years, they get to know that child. And you can diversify that. If you have 15 students in a K through two class, you can have a, a teacher's aide who is there for the three years, and you can have a parent who rotates in every year. So you've got a different parent coming in for each of the three years. So that's three adults in the classroom for 15 students. And that's quite enough for everybody to have that kind of interpersonal relationship, which they, they definitely needed at that end. Up, up to the age of, well, the mental consciousness I've always thought comes in when Piaget talks about uh, abstract conceptualization. And Piaget says that abstract conceptualization starts around the age of 14. Uh, is when you move from concrete consciousness into this abstract conceptualization. Yes? Yeah, my, uh, I was going to bring in the dark side because I have clients who are teachers and a um, couple in particular. One trying to just beginning teacher in grade three. Um, after the Santa Rosa fires, a lot of people moved. Uh, the, they had less students enrolled, and so they weren't um, bringing, uh, bringing teachers in. Um, and so teachers get pink slips every year. And this is a real problem because they never know from year to year if they're going to have a job. Yeah. And now what's happening, and this is specifically in Santa Cruz, you know, uh, one of, uh, one in particular who every year got a, a, and this person is highly qualified, highly dedicated, at the end of the year, uh, on edge, because they got a pink slip, found another position, another school, and is always uh, trying to navigate um, between, uh, that, you know, that issue, which is just life. Yeah. And then the other one is they now have grades two and three combined, no help, handling a class of 23, 24 people, That's many much. who have psychological problems yeah. um, and issues from their home. And on top of that, what happened this year, which was really extraordinary, is that the reason this particular person got a pink slip is because the enrollment's down. People are leaving the area because of the housing price. Yeah. And as a result, you know, they say, oh, there's not enough students, and then enter the classroom and find there's an overwhelming number of students that were combined in grade two and three, and next year will be in it. So they're literally burning out some of the best teachers. But, so. Yeah, I'm aware of that because when I taught in Santa Cruz, I remember the RIF system, they call it reduction in force. And that's exactly what it was that they always made a determination. At the end of the year, basically, they were, they were firing everybody and then rehiring according to priority and, and you know, at the, at the top of the list. So I guess they're still doing that, they're basically. Doing that. You know, Same system. And that is that's, that's very stressful for teachers, yeah. yeah. I mean, they'll leave the profession. But you talked about psychological problems, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring this up because there's a very interesting book uh, written by, um, a man by the name of Maddage and, Mac and a woman by the name of McElvey. I've forgotten their first names. But the book is called uh, Children Without a Conscience. And it talks about exactly what I was saying here in the, uh, at, at this stage when the, when the self is not, is not evoked, is not activated, 
then what you have is an ego development that's out of control. And if you don't activate that self, then you end up with an awful lot of uh, sociopathic behaviors. And imagine McGelvey break it down this way, in children without a conscious, neurotic, acti a neurotic um, uh, manifestations, narcissistic and sociopathic behaviors, uh, lack of an ability to give and receive affection, self-destructive and cruelty to others, lack of friendships, phoniness, control problems, learning disabilities, and that list goes on. There's about 10 more of those things that they outline in clinical studies that they did about the unattached uh, child or the wounded child syndrome. A uh, couple preliminaries. First, my wife, as she puts it, couldn't get out of the second grade for 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, uh, I was a professor with adult students. Used to always tell them to never let their schooling interfere with their education. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And third, um, in August, I was the note taker and summarizer of a group of industrial people talking about industrial education. And they have, as they put it, nationwide, a shortage of two to 400,000 people capable of working in the technical industry of today. What to do? And so this is STEM from beginning to end. Yeah. There's so much to learn that you compiled at the end what their ideal was, uh, somebody coming into the workforce, let's say after all of this at age 22 to 24. What would they want? You look at that list, the CEOs of the company themselves could not master all that. There's so much technical stuff that it crowds out everything else. And then at the end, what they want is somebody that's capable of understanding the problems of the company and putting all this together. There's an opening here somewhere. Because that approach to things reaches its limit. We found it. Yeah. Well, there's too much, you know, the, like I said, the STEM curriculum just puts too much emphasis on all of that. And, the, and even as you said, you can't learn enough through the STEM curriculum to get that job. So what you need to do is you, you really need to develop the individual personality in the K through 12 system. That's what the K through 12 system was designed for and that's what it really should be. It's not a training institute or shouldn't be. Well, I think we're done with the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have until 1.30.